uh, today we will start uh, lectures for module 4 of this lecture series. In this module, we are going to discuss two subjects which may look unrelated. One is electrometallurgy and the other is refining of metals. We have previously discussed pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy and I defined pyrometallurgy as metallurgical operations at high temperatures using high temperature phases and hydrometallurgy as metallurgical operations mostly in aqueous media sometimes using organic solvents, but almost always at pretty low temperatures. I am discussing electrometallurgy separately for two reasons. First of all, electrometallurgy came into the scene much later than pyrometallurgy or hydrometallurgy. You know, it had to wait for the discovery of electricity, invention of electricity, which happened only in the mid 19th century or so. Until Faraday had the invention of electricity, there was no question of electrometallurgy. He could not possibly have produced uh, metals by electrolysis. So, electrometallurgy is a relatively recent metallurgical activity. But that is not the only reason why I am separating it out from pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy. It so happens that in electrometallurgy very often you produce metals which do not need further refining. Two prime examples are zinc produced by electrolysis aluminum produced by electrolysis, zinc from aqueous solutions, aluminum from fuse sort media. Actually, we could have done with less purity at least in the case of zinc, because much of zinc goes in for galvanizing, where very high purities are not required. But to have electrolysis of aqueous solutions. You need to have solutions which are very pure, which do not have other impurities, which will also get electrolyzed at that time. So, there is a great deal of purification before the zinc liquor is made for electrolysis. So, whether we want it or not, the zinc comes out as 99.99 percent .99 pure. In the case of aluminum also aluminum produced is very poor. That is why I consider electrometallurgy to be a kind of uh, a processing step which gives you pure metals very often. And then of course, we will discuss uh, refining of metals which are necessary for bulk metals produced by pyrometallurgy because in pyrometallurgy very often the goal is to produce lot of metal at a time and then not only purify the metal, but recover from the metal many other uh, metals which are there. In hydrometallurgy also, we we need refining of the of the uh, leach liquor, lot of compounds that you produce. So, in this module, we will first discuss uh, electrometallurgy that will need about 2 3 lectures and after that, I will consider uh, general principles of refining of metals. You will note that so far we have not started discussing extractive metallurgy of any metal in specifically. We have given examples of production of this metal or that metal, like in the lecture we just uh, did yesterday, we talked about precipitation of nickel and cobalt by hydrogen reduction of nickel am amines and cobalt amines in aqueous solution. But they were to give as an illustration of a principle. We have not started talking about specifically extraction of any metal. We will we'll do that after a couple of lectures. I have finished talking about principles of electrometallurgy, 
principles of refining, then we will start with metals in groups. Now, the principles of hydrometallurgy, uh, electrometallurgy uh, lectures, we, we have the in this we have the following learning objectives as we have listed. We will start with classification of electrometallurgical processes. Generally, we think that electrometallurgy means only electrolysis of aqueous media and few salts. But that is not the case. Actually, the definition of electrometallurgy is metallurgical processes which make use of electricity or electrical effects. Use of electricity and electrical effects, and under that, many, many uh, things come. We will come to that after I have gone through this list of learning objectives. We will go through a classification of electrometrical processes. We will discuss something about the structure of solvent media, aqueous solutions as well as fused salts. We will talk about molten salt systems and a model called Temkin model for molten salt systems. Then we will come to principles of electrolysis and electrorefining, because in electrometallurgy, we are going to discuss electrolysis and electrorefining only. I will not discuss many other things which come under electrometallurgy. Finally, we will also talk about performance criteria for an electrolytic cell. When do we say an electrolytic cell is operating well? Let us look at the way electrometallurgy is classified. Electrometallurgy can mean processes using electrochemical effects that necessarily make use of electrodes and that also has two classifications like we can have spontaneous process and generation of electricity like we have in corrosion and fuel cell these also come under electrometallurgy. Non spontaneous processes and consumption of electricity under this will come anodic processes and cathodic processes. Cathodic processes refer to electro winning, electro refining, electro plating, electro forming, electro deposition. In all these cases, metal ions deposit at the cathode. Whereas, the anodic processes have two classification anodic oxidation for example, anodizing of aluminum or electro dissolution like instead of depositing a metal you may actually dissolve it by passing electricity. An example is electro cleaning, electro polishing, electro grinding, electro machining and electro leaching. It can take out the metal from the surface using electricity and it is a non spontaneous process. It does not happen on its own. You have to apply uh, uh, voltage across electrodes, you have to pass an electricity. Whereas, in the spontaneous processes, it happens without you are trying to apply a voltage or you are trying to pass a current. Then we have processes utilizing thermal effects like electrothermics, these arc furnaces that use for smelting uh, electricity, they also come under electrometallurgy. But here in this course, we will restrict ourselves to only these two electro winning and electro refining because these are directly related to metal production. The other things are important also, but I am I'm afraid uh, there is no time for discussing those things here. Now, 
for electrolysis or electro refining we necessarily need a proper electrolyte in which through which will pass current there are some requirements uh, for a proper electrolyte and i have listed these here an electrolyte for application in electrolysis or electro refining must have sufficiently high ionic conductivity means entire electronic conduction must be through migration of ions now not all electrolytes have even though they may be ionic not all electrolytes are equally good electrolytes we need electrolytes where the conductivity is high where the ions move fast where there are lots of ions we want no electronic conductance electronic conductance like we have in metallic substances would short circuit the electrodes means current will pass through that body without creating or achieving any ionic dissociation it will pass through only to heat the body we don't want that secondly the electrolyte to be used must be inert towards the electrode the container materials the and the electrolysis products it's obvious here. if the electrolysis products start reacting with the electrolyte as that can happen sometimes then it is not a good electrolyte it becomes it is becomes a reactant it has to be a medium where the metal from which the metal will come out and will not re dissolve the electrolyte must be stable at temperatures of operation this is there is no problem in the case of aqueous media but when you talk about fused salt fused salt electrolysis we need to have salts which are stable which will not vaporize or which will not dissociate very important criterion which should be obvious but it needs mentioning is that if we have a salt dissolved in a media then the media must be more stable than the salt under the voltage we are applying for electrolysis we do not want the media to get electrolyzed we want only the solute to be electrolyzed and the what i have said applies both in the case of aqueous media as well as in, in the case of fused salts from aqueous media we industrially produce copper zinc tin gold manganese and some other things in fused salt media industrially from fused salt media we get aluminum magnesium sodium potassium thorium zirconium titanium in theory almost all metals can be obtained through fused salt electrolysis in theory but then these are the ones which find uh, maximum application now before i proceed let me say a few words about the structure of electrolyte normally we do not pause to think what structure of water is like we think water is made up of h2o molecules it is not exactly that the <coughs> molecule of h2o is written like this it is called a what we call a polar molecule means we do not have the hydrogen on opposite sides of oxygen so as to be straight in one line for some reason the hydrogen atoms are attached to oxygen in an angle of 105 degrees now this implies that it is not completely neutral charge wise because in this space on this side there is a negative charge on this side there is some residual positive charge so it is slightly negatively charged this is slightly positively charged because of this angularity and because of this this slightly positively charged oxygen is attracted 
to a slightly positively charged hydrogen atom. And there it is, these get attached to each other in the, in the water medium. So, the result of such association is a liquid which has a very high dielectric constant because it is not one simple single molecule, another single molecule. They have all got associated. They are called associated molecules. And because of this association, we have a medium with high, very high dielectric constant, which helps in the breakdown of crystal lattice of ionic compounds. When ionic compounds like sodium chloride or some other things are put there, it is this high dielectric constant water which helps to break them and dissociate them. And after they are dissociated, <coughs> they form complexes like this with the metallic ions. Here is a hydrated cupric ion written as C u H 2 O 4 2 plus as shown here. The arrows represent coordinate bonds formed when each oxygen atom donates an electron pair to cupric ion and stabilizes the configuration. As I said, it is slightly negatively charged, it is slightly positively charged this side. So, because it is slightly negatively charged, it gets attached to uh, C u 2 plus ion and this happens from four sides, we get a complex like this. Now, this kind of complexes can be formed with ammonia N H 3, chlorine ions, C n minus ions, O H ions, P 2 O 7 form minus ions. So, all this kind of thing complex can form in ionic media and we have, I have referred to this uh, nickel amine and cobalt amines earlier. In general, I can say that most echo solutions of metal compounds contain complexed metal ions, not metal ion free as such. And this complex is may be formed as I said by N H 3, C L minus, C N minus, O H minus, P 2 O 7 etcetera, etcetera. In ammoniacal solution, nickel ions forms a series of amines, which we can write as N I N H 3 2 plus sub x where x varies from 1 to 6. If HCl is added to an echo solution of copper sulphate, the solvated cupric ion progressively loses water molecules to finally form a complex containing only chlorine ion. But before that, there is a series of uh, complex ions. Now, this is the, the way we look at ions in a aqueous medium. How do we write the electrolysis, electrolysis uh, that takes place in an aqueous medium? If you consider what happens normally that we have a leached or roasted ore say we had an ore MOX, we, we have obtained by roasting from a say sulphide. If it is dissolved in an acid, we from metal ions. These metal ions as I said may, or may be complexed, but let us look at the way we will produce metal by aqueous electrolysis. After purification of the leach liquor, we proceed for electrolysis, where there is the anode and cathode reactions like this. We can write like this X H 2 O giving you the anode hydrogen ions and oxygen and metal ions giving metal at the cathode. On the whole, the recirculated acid that and liberated at the anode goes back for leaching. At the anode, we are liberating acid which can be consumed for leaching. And the overall reaction is 
M O X giving opening up to metal and oxygen. So, if things are done properly in acid media, if we electrolyze a the metal oxide that we have got from a sulfide and that we have dissolved in the acid, there would be no overall consumption of acid or water. On the whole, everything can be recirculated because acid is being regenerated and you are not consuming on the whole any oxygen. In HCl solution, this may be chlorine. However, this is in theory, this may not happen in practice because of a variety of reasons. Now, coming to electrolysis of fused salts, we should first know what we mean by molten salts. Molten salts are ionic media and they come under the category of melts. By melts, we mean molten media which are ionic or which may not be ionic but no water. So, metals are melts or inorganic salts when they are molten are melts, slags are melts, even glasses are melts. In molten inorganic salts, there can be single there can be single component systems like say ionic systems potassium bromide they should be capital B. There can be molecular systems like mercury chloride, it is not an ionic uh, halide. We can have multi component systems, which can be molecular or ionic mixtures like HgCl2, NaCl, it can be a molecular mixture like HgCl, ZrCl2, it can be an ionic mixture. Obviously, molten salts which are not ionic, but molecular in nature, they cannot serve as media for electrolysis. Not even when there is partly ionic and partly molecular nature. We need for electrolysis medium which is fully ionic, highly conducting and very often they are the halides fluorides or chlorides mostly. And in halides and chlorides, only halides and chlorides dissolve very easily. There are very few examples where an oxide mineral will dissolve in a halide. And therefore, you will find most electrolysis processes or few salt electrolysis processes would imply dissolution of a halide in another halide media. Of course, that media is more stable and the halide which is to be decomposed is less stable. The electrolysis of aluminum is a very rare exception. There an oxide Al 2 O 3 is dissolved in sodium in cryolite which is written as 3 C A F 3 N A F 3 I am forgetting mm, what is cryolite anyway I will tell you later it is a fluoride. So, there is a case of an oxide dissolving in a fluoride, but normally oxides do not dissolve in halides. What is the nature of these ionic compounds. Such as fused salts. Yeah, I just remembered that cryolite is written as 3 N A F A L F 3. 3 N A F a L F 3 or N A 3 A L F 6. 
which is a naturally occurring mineral, but it can also be artificially, it can also be artificially prepared. We will discuss that when we come to discuss electrolysis of aluminum. Now, let us discuss the structure of uh, fuel salts. Now, if we consider a molten salt like molten sodium chloride, obviously there are ions distributed, but we cannot conceive a picture where in the in the liquid the sodium ions let me represent only by plus they are only at one side and the chlorine ions are at another corner you cannot have segregation of plus and minus ions because if that was the case the, you could think of some device where you only take out this part so that you have metal ions and you will have chlorine ions separated that is not possible because the plus ions attract the negative ions and the minus ions attract the plus ions a cation has to be always surrounded by anions and anion always has to be surrounded by cations now we can represent that in a two dimensional picture like this that suppose you talk about NaCl we are not going to charge is surrounded by chlorine then there will be another arrangement of plus ions beyond then again chlorine ions beyond that now here if you look at this arrangement you if you look at a sodium ion it is surrounded by chlorine if you look at chlorine you will find it is surrounded by sodium if you look at sodium it is surrounded by chlorine if you look at chlorine it will be surrounded by sodium this is happening or in other words we have in sodium chloride a lattice where some lattice positions are occupied by sodium around which the other lattice positions are taken up by chlorine and then again there are some lattice positions which are occupied by sodium ions. So, it is said that an ionic liquid an ionic molten salt is characterized by a lattice where there is a distinctive sub lattice for plus ions and there is a distinctive sub lattice for negative ions and these are intertwined. So, let me repeat in a molten salt always for charge neutrality positive ions will be surrounded by negative ions, negative ions will be surrounded by positive ions. The positive ions distribute them in a lattice of their own and in the negative and the negative ions distribute in a lattice of their own and these two lattices are intertwined. This was the model given by a gentleman called Temkin and it is a very famous model known as Temkin model and this assumption leads to some some conclusions which are very interesting. What it says is that suppose you have sodium chloride here sodium ions have a lattice of sodium ions 
chlorine ions are in a lattice or sub lattice of chlorine ions. Now, in this mixture, if you add some other molten salt like say potassium chloride, potassium chloride gives potassium ions, it will give chlorine ions. Now, there is no problem, these chlorine ions that are added, they can go into the lattice that, that is made up of chlorine ions. The potassium ions have to go to the cation lattice, it cannot go and occupy any position where there is chlorine ion. Let us make it a little more complicated. Suppose we add potassium bromide into sodium chloride then potassium ions must go to the sub lattice where there are cations and bromine ions must go to the sub lattice where there are anions. There can never be a situation where an anion can go into the position occupied by a cation because calculations have shown that to do that if you want to remove a cation from the influence of the surrounding anions, you need energy which would be more than the energy required to completely volatilize the, the melt. In other words, the cations and anions are so strongly bound that there is no way you can take, you can make an anion take the place of a cation which is surrounded by anions. Now, this takes us to another very interesting conclusion. That conclusion is this, that suppose we have sodium chloride and potassium chloride mixture. We want to know what is the activity of sodium chloride. Now, according to Temkel model, activity of sodium chloride is really the probability of finding a sodium ion and a chlorine ion together. This is the probability. Now, we can also write for this, this will be equal to the ionic fraction of sodium into ionic fraction of chlorine. Now, this is, this may appear something very obvious that in the entire body, we have to find out what is the ionic fraction of sodium, which means the fraction of sodium ions amongst all the cations and fraction of chlorine ions amongst all the anions. Now, so far it is very simple. Now, since we only have a chlorine ion, this is always one because it is only chlorine, the fraction of chlorine ions has to be one because there are only anions and anions are chlorine ions. So, the fraction mole fraction of sodium ions would be as per the proportion of sodium chloride and chlorine. Means, if there is 50 percent of by mole of sodium chloride and 50 percent by mole of potassium chloride, this will be 0 0.5, this is 1. Therefore, this will be 0 0.5 no problem. You have 50 50 sodium chloride and potassium chloride. So, the ionic fraction of sodium will be 0 0.5, ionic fraction of chlorine is 1, the product is 0 0.5. It seems very obvious, but see the complication we have. If we have sodium chloride and potassium bromide, let be 50 mole percent, 50 mole percent. 
we want to know the activity of sodium chloride, it will be ionic fraction of sodium multiplied by ionic fraction of chlorine, which means number of sodium ions in the cation lattice. Now, here 50 percent of the cations are accounted by sodium, other 50 is by potassium. So, this will be 0 0.5. Now, see here now. Now, this bromine that you have put, it has gone into the anionic lattice and it is occupying 50 percent of the positions. So, this will now also become 0 0.5. So, the activity of sodium chloride will now become 0 0.25. So, the Temkin model gave a, a revolutionary twist to our picture of the, uh, the ionic network in fused media. And this concept we will make use of later on when we discuss a complex um, salts with lots of uh, components. Let us make it little more complicated. Suppose, we have a mixture of calcium chloride and potassium bromide. Again, we have 50 mole percent, 50 mole percent. We want to find out the activity of potassium bromide it will be ionic fraction of potassium into into the ionic fraction of bromine and this is number of cations divided by all cations into number of anions minus uh, divided by all anions. Now, here if you see that, we have now in the cation lattice 50 percent potassium, 50 percent calcium, no problem, they are go both going to cation lattice. So, it will be 0 0.5, but what about here? In the anion lattice now, there are twice as many chlorine ions than you have bromine ions. So, the fraction of bromine ions become one third. So, the activity of this in 50 50 solution calcium chloride and potassium bromide will become 1 by 6. It is very interesting that you have 50 percent of this, 50 percent of this, but in the case of sodium chloride potassium chloride 50 50 will still mean activity of sodium chloride is half, but if when you start bringing in other ions, then the Temkin's activity expression begin to give you all kinds of things. Interestingly, let us end this, this discussion by looking at a mixture of say calcium chloride and potassium bromide again. What we can say that we can think in this media, we actually have a mixture of not only calcium chloride, concept of calcium chloride, we have a concept of calcium bromide, we have a concept of potassium bromide, we have a concept of potassium chloride, because in the entire thing we have potassium ions, chlorine ions, bromine ions and calcium ions. So, you can always think of activity of calcium chloride which is one chlorine, one uh, calcium in the neighborhood of two chlorine, one calcium ion in the neighborhood of two bromine, potassium bromine means one potassium in the neighborhood of one bromine, one 
cal uh, potassium ion in the neighborhood of 1 chlorine ion. So, in this mixture, we can talk about activities of this, activities of this, activities of this, activities of this. If we make the calculations, all these activities, however, will have to come to 1, because this will take care of all possibilities. This is the probability of finding calcium chloride together with this, 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 etcetera. So, we can do all kinds of calculations, with some of which I will do later, but this must be remembered that in a few salt medium, when we bring in another salt, then we reduce its activity very effectively, not in proportional anymore to its relative abundance, but in terms of its ionic distribution. We can have tremendous effect on the activity of, uh, of these species. Maybe I will I will do some problems on this later. Now, I would like to come to an end of this by pointing out a few figures to you, which is to illustrate some features of electro winning from aqueous solution and electro winning from fuel source. Here are some typical data for electro winning of aqueous systems. You see the kind of purity you obtained, copper 99.5, cobalt 93 to 99.9, zinc 99.9 or more, chromium 99.8. In aqueous electro winding, the current efficiencies are also high generally. What do you mean by current efficiency? By current efficiency, which I will define properly later we mean the fraction of current that is used for the electrolytic deposition, electrolytic dissociation we have in mind. Means, the current should go only for electrolyzing the solute, which is going to deposit the metal. It should not be consumed of other reactions. The cell voltages are low, because aqueous uh, systems do not need high voltage, especially say copper 2, 2 volt, zinc 3.5, power consumptions figures are given and anode cathode I will discuss later. When you come to electro refining, you will find that the the uh, what is it that you go? Our uh, cell voltages will be low. Look at the cell voltage 0 0.15, 1 1.5, 1 1.5, very low. Why do we have low voltages when you talk about electro refining? So, basically, in electro refining, what we do is that we will have an impure anode, imp impure. Uh, slab of the metal as anode and a pure thin sheet as cathode. And when we have a medium where we are doing the electrolysis, say, we want metal ions to dissolve here and metal ions to deposit there. So, this thin sheet will gradually become thick as a pure sheet, whereas this impure metal will dissolve. Now, essentially in such a process, here we have metal, metal ion potential, here also we have metal ion, metal potential. Essentially, there are other things, but essentially we are dealing with two potentials which are very much near each other and therefore, the electro refining will not need high voltages. Whereas, in the other cases when we electrolyze, we have a we have an anode which is different from the cathode 
and the, the voltage required is high. So, in this cases you will find the process is like electrolysis, we will have the same kind of uh, materials and electrolytes and other things, but voltage required would be low. Now, here are some typical data for electro winning from molten salts. Now, molten salts would mean high temperatures, aluminum electrolysis will be at 960 to 1000, magnesium more than 700, titanium 500, beryllium 900. So, when you have high temperatures, your current efficiency cannot be, can be high, but your energy efficiencies will be low because part of the energy go will go into the heating of the cell. Cell voltages will be on the high side, because few salts are stabler than echo solution. So, this is the essential difference between uh, aqueous electrolysis and few salt electrolysis. Now, in many systems, there is a very simple method of finding out what is the voltage required for electrolysis and that is that we will pass through two electrodes a current and we will plot, we will apply voltage, we will gradually increase the voltage and see the current passing through the medium. Initially, there will be hardly anything, any current, but the end point will come where we will find a current has begun to flow. This indicates the decomposition voltage, the voltage required to decompose the medium. In the case of fused salts, generally this takes a different kind of shape, because many other kinds of residual reactions can take place. And we can say that with still we can get a guidance as to what will be the decomposition potential. Now, in the data I have shown, I have made a mention of zinc electrolysis and you need to ask this question that we have always been told that when zinc is in an acid media, hydrogen will evolve and zinc will dissolve. Zinc is reactive more reactive than hydrogen and that is why when we try to precipitate zinc by hydrogen, we found it was not possible. Even in highly alkaline thing, it was not possible. Perhaps you need very high pressures of hydrogen to precipitate zinc, but during electrolysis, we can take out zinc from solution. Although in the electrochemical series, zinc is above hydrogen and normally zinc in acid solution will dissolve to, to bring out hydrogen. We can produce zinc by electrolysis of acid solution. How is it possible? The expression to this phenomena lies in what we call the over voltage phenomenon. Over voltage phenomenon is the phenomenon which changes the normal zinc zinc ion potential. Means the electrode potential will no longer be what you have seen in the electrode potential series. It will be dropped to below hydrogen, or you can say it will, the hydrogen will go above zinc. Why should this happen? This, the, 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 the two reasons behind such phenomenon. Now, assume a, a general situation where during an actual operation, the cations are coming to the surface of the electrode surface, where they are going to be discharged and deposited as metal. Now, you have seen in the case of leaching or cementation, whenever ions are moving towards the surface, they have to, they are 
going because of two reasons. First of all, there is an electro electrical voltage uh, applied. So, there is pressure on the cations to move from this side to that side, but they must come through a process of diffusion through the aqueous media. And when they come from here to here, they have to go across a, a boundary layer. And this is where a concentration gradient is set up. Now, when we increase the current, increasing the current means you are pushing more cations per unit time, which means you are trying to force the cations to go and get discharged in increasing amounts. So, when that happens, that gradient increases, because if you want more diffusion of cations from this side to that side to the surface, the gradient has to be more. So, it is said that as you gradually increase the current, the diffusion profile changes. And finally, a situation comes where the surface concentration of cation will fall to 0. We call this situation a situation of limiting current density, that you cannot pass any more current you cannot produce for the given area at, a, at the metal at a higher rate anymore, because the gradient cannot increase anymore. And here also there are two sub steps, one is diffusion and then whatever happens at the surface metal ion getting discharged. So, two steps are involved the diffusional step and the surface reaction step. Now, you see the potential between metal and metal ion depends on the metal ion concentration here. When this phenomenon is going on, then there can be a different metal metal ion potential, because metal ion concentration at the surface has changed. Similarly, when we look at the phenomenon of metal ion coming into in equilibrium with, with the metal surface that reaction step is also important. So, we actually during actual electrolysis these two steps are disturbed and zinc zinc ion potential is no longer what it was in the electrochemical series. We say there is an over voltage zinc zinc ion voltage has changed. As a matter of fact it changes to an extent when hydrogen hydrogen becomes more reactive than zinc and hydrogen replaces zinc from solution and zinc ion deposits. Well, I will I will try to explain this again if necessary when we come to discuss the subject, but I will conclude today by saying that electrometallurgy came much later than pyrometallurgy and hydrometallurgy, but it is in a sense more sophisticated, because electricity is an invention of modern times and electrolytic processes produce very pure metals. Electrometallurgy means many things as I have said, because it, it means uh, use of electricity and electrical effects but we are restricting ourselves in this course only to discussion of electrolysis and electro refining, where the process is not spontaneous. You have to apply a voltage, pass a current, make ions move from this side to that side, make metal cations deposit to produce a metal. I will continue with this subject, because uh, it is very vital metal production and I will also try to discuss some problems. Thank you very much.